So good morning. So first I would like to say it's a pleasure to be here. Actually last time I was in Russia is 1984, so it's time to return. So pleased to be here and as you heard the title of my presentation is about acoustic characterization of turbo machinery. And I come from the Royal Institute of Technology, which is the technical university in Stockholm. And I work for this Marcus Wallenberg Laboratory, which is a large center for acoustic sound vibration research. Uh, and the title of this is sort of motivated, you could say, by mainly work we've done experimentally. So what happened during the last 10 years is that these experimental methods more and more got involved in numerical simulations. We sort of discovered that these methods also could be used very effectively to extract acoustic data from, from numerical simulations. So that's what I'll try to talk about here. Okay, first a little bit about us. So this is the team. Marcus Wallenberg Laboratory at KTH in Stockholm. And we're about 30 people, professors and lecturers, and around 20 to 50 students. And what you see behind those people are the sort of main campus of KTH in the middle of Stockholm. So the contents of my presentations is, sorry? Yeah, but they had some sort of, you know, feedback, so I was a bit worried about the feedback. Okay, thanks. So, it's background, acoustic insulation effects, air acoustic multiports. I will define sort of this procedure we call multiport, because that's what we used to use for the experiments, but we realized this is also very effectively nowadays when you have very high fidelity CFD computations, which you can also try to extract acoustics from. Uh, then I will give examples of experimental numerical characterization using these multiports and sort of sum up everything I said at the end of the course. And as you also notice in my abstract, which I have in the proceedings, so there's a reference list. So basically everything <coughs> I say here you can find in course in journal papers. Okay, a little bit about the background then. Obviously, I mean, if you think about turbine machinery, there are various lots of numerous applications from this, varying from, from ventilation fans to turbochargers used in automotive engines to oil and gas power plants, process industry. So there are numerous applications for this. But one large difference, I would say, compared to, let's say, the aeronautical, as you see here, I don't show any aeronautical applications, is that very often we have pipes and ducts. So most of these sources are confined. And that means you very rarely have a free field condition, meaning that you really have to include the coupling of the source to the environment. So you get what I call acoustic installation effects, meaning that the Green's function is not really a free space Green's function. And speaking as an acoustician, I would say that many people in this computational fluid dynamics community, they don't really perhaps appreciate this difference, that they very often treat problems like you have a free field response, assuming that you're radiating to infinite space. But in many cases, we are not in that situation. You have ducts or pipes, very confined circumstances. You really have to consider the response of the system when you connect your sources to that environment. So, okay, traditionally, air acoustics started with this. You all know, light tilt theory. So we have the air acoustic analogy from the 1950s. And essentially, we're extracting sort of the wave equation from the Navier-Stokes equations, putting everything which is not fitting to the wave equation operator as a source term. So this is the uh, light of air acoustic analogy. Thank you. So looking at that equation as a basis, one can sort of say that, okay, the standard situation which was envisioned by light is that you have flow. Given the flow, you can compute the sound. So that's alternative one. But actually, as was discovered by Powell and Howe, you can also have a sound field which sort of interacts with the flow, like situation two here, meaning that you have some vortex separation which is interacting with the incident sound wave, and then you get this periodic dissipation and amplification of sound as a function of the Struval number. Typically for low frequencies, you first get absorption or dissipation, but then if you increase the Struval number of frequencies, you tend to get also production or amplification of sound. And one can say that both these two are covered by light field theory. So linear air acoustics or light field acoustic analogy covers these two. And the methods I will talk about here today are sort of assuming that you can cover in your experiments or 
when you apply these models to, ex to numerical data, you can sort of capture what you have here in these first two, sound production or vortex sound interaction effects. However, since I will use linear models, you can't capture the last one, meaning that you have a full coupling here, so both flow and sound are fully coupled, and essentially you have to solve the full non-linear numerous stokes equations, and then typically a phenomena like whistling. That always you need to treat using the full non-linear numerous stokes equations. Okay, so this is sort of the, the starting point that we're trying to do these first two. So another thing then to remember is the one I said that very often for these kind of problems I will look at, you have a confined environment, meaning that you have acoustic insulation effects, that the response of your system will depend on the eigenfrequencies or resonances of this system. And this is very pronounced. Let's say you have a duct system like this. You have plane waves, you have a source to loudspeaker or something, and if you then compute or measure the acoustic power in that system as a function of frequency, you get this curves with resonances and anti-resonances. So it's very strongly dependent on the source character and the boundary conditions for that system. That will exactly depend or create that curve as a function of frequency with the acoustic power as a function of frequency. I mean, the corresponding free feed response would be more or less flat like this. So obviously for these kind of confined systems, for low frequencies, you need really to compute the response. You need to include the boundary conditions when you do your modeling error acoustically. This is also true if you increase the frequency a bit, not just in the plane wave range in the ducts. If you have a few higher order modes, this still holds. You have a very strong coupling between the sources and the boundary conditions. You really need to include all the details to do a complete air acoustic model. Obviously, if you further increase the frequency, you get up to the high frequency range, or as we acousticians, acousticians normally say, the energy-based modeling range. You can use ray acoustics, or the classical example is room acoustics in acoustics modeling, where you just use energy models to, to study your systems. So what I will discuss mainly here today is models covering the low and mid frequency range, plane waves and a few propagating higher order modes in the duct system, not very high frequencies, because then normally this coupling is weak, and you can again assume more or less free field conditions for your system. So in terms of the Helmholtz number, one could say, okay, Practically, perhaps, this means up to 10 propagating modes in a duct, or a Helmholtz number around, well, let's say less than 10, 3p. Okay, so the basis then for this acoustic multiport, well, what you see on top here is just the references at the end of this paper, or at the end of this presentation. So anyhow, the basis for this method is that you assume that you have modes in your duct, there's a duct system connected to your uh, machine, and you want to characterize that machine. You have modes in that duct system. This is modes for a circular pipe, plane wave mode, the first cross mode, the next cross mode, and the first radial mode. Now, then in the frequency domain, you can expand the pressure of those modes in a number of propagating modes. This is the mode distribution of the cross section. This is the amplitude, so the modes in the plus and minus direction with the pressure amplitudes in the frequency domain. And this is just the propagational exponential factor along the duct axis set with the modal wave numbers. So normally, as you know, for a certain frequency, you just have a finite number of propagating modes. So always if you have a certain maximum frequency in your problem, you can say, okay, this sum is limited to the propagating modes. Maybe you need to include the few of the non-propagating modes but always this is a finite sum, which you can limit with some number n for the modes you are including in your uh, model, either experimentally or numerically. So typically what we choose then, we choose the basis, these eigenfunctions on the rigged wall duct, assuming a plug flow. This is a complete functional basis, so even if this is not the correct uh, eigenfunctions considering the flow distribution, it's still a complete basis which you can use to expand the field. And for the axial wave numbers, it's important to include also the effect of the viscothermal damping, and there are some excellent papers describing that. The most recent is this one, published in 2016 by some people from, from uh, uh, Berlin, and that contains very useful formulas for, for the modal damping, including viscothermal effects. So, basically then we can formulate this as a matrix equation. 
We are sampling the sound field, and since let's say we have uh, n modes, that means the number of modal amplitudes are 2n, so we need at least m larger than 2n sampling points to determine all the unknown modal amplitudes, okay? So we sample the pressures at different points in space, and then you can write this matrix equation with the sampled pressures, and this is the unknown modal amplitudes, and then you have some modal matrix, which is just a function of these uh, eigenfunctions and the exponential propagation factor, and depends, of course, on the positions you're sampling at and the modal order n. And we assume now, as I said, we know these modes. We take them as rigid walled duct modes, so they are known or circular duct shapes or rectangular duct shapes, so they're in principle known. So if you compact that, write it in full matrix form, it looks like this, and then basically the problem is you want to determine these amplitudes from the measured pressure piece, and you know the matrix M, so inverting that, you can solve your unknown pressure amplitudes. This is called wave decomposition, and the classical is you have just plane waves, then you need two microphones because you have P plus and P minus in the two directions, it's called the two microphone method typically. But it works for any number of modes. You just need 2n, where n is the number of propagating modes, microphones to do the mode decomposition. Of course, the accuracy of this will depend on the uh, condition number for this uh, matrix M. So this is an example from a paper, reference 11, showing a case with six propagating modes in a circular duct. We had 12 microphones mounted on the duct walls. And First of all, what you discover when you analyze this is that you have sort of weak singularities related to that you have half a wavelength between any pair of probes corresponding to a certain mode n, either in the axial direction or in the circumferential direction. This gives sort of, because normally this doesn't happen for all the microphones, of course, so only for a pair of microphones. So this is not a bad case. It just increases a bit the condition number. But the strong sort of increases we get here, as you see, at these cut-on frequencies for the different modes. Then you have a strong singularity. So this one you can actually reduce a lot by optimizing your microphone mountings. So this is pretty easy to do. I mean, you run an optimization procedure trying to find the best positions in your test duct or in your experimental or numerical scheme to position your probes to minimize this condition number for this uh, matrix M. And here you see the sort of what we found for these 12 microphones we used for experiments. We could reduce the original configuration to this solid curve. Sorry, we could reduce the solid curve to the dashed one, which didn't give much improvement here, but for the higher cations, it gave a raw, large, significant improvement of the condition number. So that's an important step to take to improve this procedure. Okay, now we have the sort of basis what we need. We have the modal amplitudes for propagating modes, so we take these modal amplitudes on each side of, let's say, a fan. So if I have a reference cross-section A here, a reference cross-section B here, we do the wave decomposition to get the P plus and P minus on both sides, and then we try to, well, we basically say like we have a linear and time invariant system. We're back to this where we started. We assume we have acoustics, or acoustic by light hill, linear air acoustics, and then if this system is time invariant, we can simply make a general network model or multi-port model or a black box model saying that, okay, the incident wave amplitudes are related to the outgoing wave amplitudes by some scattering matrix with reflection on this main diagonal and transmission matrices on the off diagonal. And then in addition, we have some sound generation in the component. And since it's a linear system, we can just add that. It's superposition. But that's correct, of course, in the linear model assumption. So it's important to realize that, okay, this is now the reflection transmission of sound contained there. And uh, the first paper sort of suggesting this was quite old. This was done actually by Professor Kremer in Berlin, 1971. He had a paper in the Journal of Sound Vibration called The Treatment of Fans as Black Boxes. And that's exactly what we're saying here. Although he limited himself to plane waves, now we're extending this to higher order modes. It's basically a general procedure. The only sort of critical assumption is this, that you have a linear and time invariant system. That's the key assumption. So you can model these two problems I started with. Sound generation or vortex sound interaction effects, but not full whistling phenomena with nonlinear effects. That's sort of not possible to model. Okay, in matrix form, it looks like this. 
that we have some scattering matrix relating incident to outgoing waves and some source strength vector P plus S. Now one should realize that the sketching matrix that will contain both the reflection transmission route to geometrical area changes or other changes, plus the vortex sound interaction effects. All that is included in the scattering matrix. And the source vector, well, when it's defined like this, this uh, multiport, the source vector is by definition a reflection-free source data, meaning that when you have extracted that from your experimental or numerical data, you removed all the influence of the boundaries. So even if you, in your numerical scheme, didn't have reflection-free boundaries in your simulation, this kind of procedure removes the effect of reflection. So you don't have to worry about it in your simulations. It will be removed by this formulation. We come back to that. Okay, so what are the advantages then? Well, first of all, if we project the pressure field on the acoustic modes, we will suppress high dynamic pressure fluctuations and more or less filter out the acoustic field from the total field. Secondly, uh, the effects of boundary conditions are eliminated. I we get the reflection-free source data, which is very useful, of course. And finally, I mean, doing this sort of multiport procedure, you can sort of substructure. Let's say you have a fan in a duct system. You can have the multiport for the fan, and then you have the multiports from the connected ducts, and you can then, of course, just combine this mathematically and create the complete system, assuming that you have computed or measured each of these individual ducts. So this is very efficient for modeling. You can break it down into sub-problems and also for, for practical work. I mean, you can have these multiports for individual components and build up an entire system. Of course, in practice, I mean, the number of, uh, the order of these matrices grows as the square of the frequency. So typically, I mean, I would say, perhaps it's practically limited up to 10 modes. That's at least the largest number you can see published today. And gradually, I mean, if you move higher up, you can sometime move on to these more energy-based free-field methods, of course, if the frequency is high enough. Okay, so how is this then done in practice? So the first step you do when you want to apply this is that you try to determine the scattering matrix. So typically that's done if you assume we have n propagating waves, you have to excite this object with n different fields. And normally the case looks like this, you have your object in the middle, and then you put in loudspeakers to excite fields on different sites, if it's an experiment, and you send in these fields, and normally these signals from the loudspeakers, of course, they are completely uncorrelated with the fields created by the source itself. This source vector can be assumed to be uncorrelated by these test signals you're sending in. So you can typically assume this. This is uncorrelated. You can remove it. So you end up with this. You have measurements from n different test cases where you have done the wave decomposition. So you have the incident waves on both sides and the outgoing waves on both sides. You can then form a matrix equation for the unknown matrix S. Okay. Second step, once you know S, the scattering matrix, you can simply determine the source strength using, again, wave decomposition. Of course, now, in this case, you turn off all your loudspeakers. You just listen to your actual source, do the wave decomposition on both sides, use the known scattering matrix from the first step, and voila, this is the definition of the multiport. You can compute the source strength. And this, as you see, includes reflections. P minus are reflections from the rig or your numerical scheme. So using this, you are removing the reflections even if you have them in your numerical scheme. You can filter them out by this formulation. And then typically what you do, since this is often broadband data, you want to form it as spectra, so you form some cross-spectrum like this estimate. So this gives you the source cross-spectrum matrix with the auto spectra for each of the modes and the cross-spectra sort of the correlation between different modes. So normally what we do also to improve this further is that you need to do this kind of measurement at the number of independent uh, microphone sets. Because very often, if you work with low mic numbers, you have a relatively low signal-to-noise ratio in the measurement or in the numerical data for the acoustic part. So you need to improve that a bit. And you can do that by sort of repeating this procedure I just showed you at the number of sets of microphones. The problem is that each of these sets needs to contain enough for a full wave decomposition. 
So each of the sets needs to contain two N microphones, which numerically normally have lots of points available. It's not a problem to apply this, but experimentally, normally you don't have that many microphones available. So in the experiments, typically people measure the reflection matrix of the rig, reformulate the previous equation, so you can sort of write it like this, and then you just need half as many reference microphones. Basically, you can use the original set of mics, divide them in two, and do this improvement of the data. But it requires a separate measurement of the reflection. So for experiments, you normally go for five, pssst, but for numerical data, you can normally apply this previous, sorry, previous, this one. Okay, summarizing again then. So difference then between experimental versus numerical characterization is in experiments, normally we can only access pressure data at the walls. We can't really stick in microphones, obviously. However, in simulations, obviously, you have the possibility to have pressure probes everywhere, no problem. And in addition, you have all field components. You can actually use pressure and, let's say, axial velocity for the model decomposition. So you have much, much more data which you can use for this model decomposition, which makes it, you can easily make a very strong overdetermination. The same goes for the excitation of incident fields for the scattering matrix measurement. Normally, you can just mount sources or loudspeakers on the walls to measure, uh, the, uh, to create incident fields and get the scattering. And typically, these loudspeakers doesn't excite a single mode, but a number of modes. However, in simulations, it's very easy to ex excite a single mode at a time and very efficiently then determine the scattering matrix. Finally, for the source part, in experiments with low max numbers, with this problem to low signal to noise ratio, one way to handle it is to have a long measurement time. That's easy in experiments. You can easily measure for half an hour or one hour. In simulations, you don't have this possibility. I mean, normally, if you have a large area simulation, maybe you have a second if you're lucky, often much less. But you have a very, very large number of sampling points, meaning that you can use this procedure at a very large number of points. And that can compensate for the very short simulation time you have. Okay, going to some examples for what we've done at the gate. So this is sort of a summary of uh, the cases we've done the last 10 years at KTH. And normally they have been done in cooperation either with the people at the fluid mechanics department doing the computational fluid dynamics part, thank you, or also as part of European projects like the last one here where the computational fluid dynamics was done by Michael Schul from St. Petersburg and NTS. Uh, they used their sort of uh, IDDS code to do the simulations for the last one. So today I will, uh, I don't think I have time to talk about all this. You have details in the references. I will talk about the first one and also the third one. So the first one, uh, it's a single orifice. It's only plane waves. And here the aim was to analyze and get the scattering matrix, not the sun generation. And via the scattering matrix, look at this amplification and dissipation and then analyze whistling. So uh, this is the problem. You see some data. It's a low Mach case. The inflow velocity is around 10 meters per second. The medium is air. And we have a small duct, 30 millimeter, orifice plate, which is 5 millimeter in length, and area contraction ratio of around 0.4, meaning that the velocity here is about four or five times larger than in this incoming flow. So. At this time, this is about 10, 12 years ago when we did this, we didn't really have a method to solve the scattering matrix. So what we did then was that we started to look at linear Navier Stokes methods. That means basically you linearize the Navier Stokes equations and we added one assumption to throw out the energy equation. You assume that still the ordinary relationship between pressure and density is valid also in this case. So we have an isentropic process so we can skip the energy equation from the average Stokes. We also wanted to work in the frequency domain in order to avoid uh, absolute instabilities. 
Of course, we are keeping the convective instabilities, but we can remove the absolute instabilities by going to the frequency domain. And also for acoustics, if you have frequency-dependent boundary conditions, we prefer normally to be in the frequency domain. And it's a linear problem, so there's no reason not to go to the frequency domain. And also for this case, we decided to just use a 2D uh, model. So these are the equations, conservation of mass, and then the two equations of momentum in the x and y direction. And one thing to note here, which we will see a little bit more later, here we just have added the normal viscosity in the fluid. There is no added viscosity in this model, just the normal viscosity in the medium. So an example of the result. This shows the uh, result. And the computations were done uh, in this frequency range, 100 to 5,000, with this frequency step, 100 hertz. We used sort of a finite element standardized code for solving uh, partial differential equations using FEM. At this time, when this was done, they didn't have a module for, for linear snarl stokes, so we did wrote this ourselves to solve the equations we had defined. Nowadays, actually, Comsol provides, partly because of the work we did, they provide the module for linear snarl stokes equations in the frequency domain. So this is an example of a result, 800 hertz, density fluctuations. We have an incoming plane wave which goes through the orifice. And you can see that downstream of the orifice, you get this vortex excitation. You have propagating vorticity, which is convected with the mean flow speed, basically, and then are decaying, and gradually further downstream, you have the propagating transmitted plane wave, which for this frequency will be at a reduced amplitude because here the vortex sound interaction is mainly dissipative. So doing these simulations, extracting the scattering matrix by sending in waves, either from the up or downstream side to measure reflection and transmission and using wave decomposition as we have described, we could then extract this scattering matrix. Here it's written a little bit different from before because now the reflection is on this off diagonal and the transmission is on the main diagonal. That's just how you sort of order these elements here. So, okay, the results then for this reflection transmission elements for the case we studied, incident flow speed 0, 0 044 Mach. Transmission is here, and reflection is here. You directly see that the two transmission coefficients are a bit weird because they are larger than one. Just before 2000 hertz, you have a peak here which is around 1.1, meaning that you have amplification in this case. So in the range around 2000, this orifice is amplified, which is captured now by this scheme, the linear snarroscope scheme, and is fully sort of, as we said before, it's contained in this scattering matrix data. Here you see the amplification. So to prove that, one can make a power balance, compute the, well, just say you have an incident wave, and then you compare the power in the incident wave with the power coming out. You take the difference, and you get the power amplification. How much more power is sort of, well, what is the escaped power from the power you send in? Normally you would expect this to be positive because you have dissipation, so this is less than what you send in. And indeed, it's positive in these frequency ranges, but here around 2000, it's negative. Just where they had this larger value of the transmission coefficient, you do get amplification. Net power is produced, you amplify the incident waves. And of course, if you couple then this orifice to a system, to a system with reflections around two kilohertz, you can get a whistle. So to prove that, we built this little tube. We put the orifice here. So we had a tube then with reflections at both ends, and we put that into our test rooms. Actually, this was an echo chamber with pressurized air, so we could get the flow. And then the outlet where we could measure the radiator sound was in the reverberation chamber. So we had a few of these pipes, and I will show you two results. So we see one of the pipes, this is the outer spectrum, measured sound pressure level in the reverberation chamber as a function of the frequency of the number. First one, well, you just see the pipe resonances, no whistling. Second pipe, you have a distinct whistle, and the frequency for that is very close to this 2000 hertz we saw before. To prove that, you can actually do an analysis based on what is called the Nyquist in control theory, because if you plot the system response, which is this kind of equation, the unit matrix minus the scattering matrix times the reflection matrix for determinations, if you plot the determinant of that as function of the frequency, oops, you get what is called the Nyquist plot. 
And if that encloses origo, you will have a root in the lower half plane, indicating that you have an unstable eigenfrequency, which is amplifying sound. So the case with no whistle is here. It doesn't circle on encircle origo, no whistling, according to Nyquist. The other case, whistling is here, and indeed we have an encirclement of origo at the red dot, and that's exactly the frequency where you find the peak in the whistling spectrum. So you can use this linearized theory to predict whistling frequencies. And it's very neat because even if the model can't predict the level, because it's a linear model, you can exactly analyze how much damping you need to include to remove this, to move this root so it's on the other side of origo, and it doesn't create whistling. So from an engineering point of view, the problem is solved because you don't want whistling, you're not building a flute, you're trying to remove it. And here you can analyze exactly what you need to do to do that. So I think I will maybe skip this one. Um, and go to the next. This is, i take it very briefly, this is more or less the same as still an orifice, but it's done by large eddy simulation, meaning that in the previous case, of course, using uh, Linear average stokes equations, we could just get the, the scattering, but here we can obviously get everything, both the scattering and the sound generation. So this kind of uh, simulation will give you everything. And some short lessons learned from this was that this is the result again from the scattering matrix. This is now the reflection here, these two, and this is the uh, transmission. Again, here we had some amplification around some frequency not as strong as in the previous case. But there's a big difference compared to the measurements and the simulations. This red solid is measurement, and these crosses or circles are simulations. The simulations were done for two cases, circular duct or square duct. It doesn't really matter for the plane wave. But for the flow, of course, it's a difference. And one thing you could see that close to this frequency where we have actually tendency for amplification, there is a large variation in numerical data, especially for the circular duct. And the reason is that in this case, they didn't use a perturbed inflow. So you had a perfectly laminar flow with no turbulence coming into the orifice. And that created much, much, much stronger vortex sound interaction and amplification, as we can see here. With the square duct, the disturbance to the inflow was a bit larger. So you got closer to the experiments using a square duct for the modeling than with a circular duct. So it really shows that this vortex sound amplification, of course, it's very sensitive to the disturbances, turbulence level you have on the inflow. That really affects. So, so, I mean, and that's something you can, of course, control when you're doing numerical simulations. In experiments, we always have a certain turbulence level. Here you can turn it on and off by varying things on the inflow. So that's one of the things you can do numerically, which is impossible experimentally. So in this case, they use pure harmonic incident waves to, to do the uh, uh, scattering matrix data. And in order to, to uh, clean the source data, they sort of use not only just projecting the field on the plane wave to remove uh, turbulence, but also they use phase averaging, moving the data, assuming that the sound waves propagate to the speed of sound. And then you could sort of improve the data using that. Okay, let's move to the final. Actually, I will just briefly show this one before we move to the final, because we also did a T-junction, and that looks like this. For plane waves, this becomes a three-port. You have plane waves in each of these three ducts. You can describe it by a three-port scattering matrix like this. And one thing we needed here to get the modeling to work was to actually include this eddy viscosity in the linear snarvis stokes equation model. Because here again, we used linear snarvis stokes, but it turned out very difficult here to get the results to agree with the experiments unless we added eddy viscosity here. And there are a number of recent papers on how to do that. And one of the papers we published, you see it here on the bottom, and that's the one that we used to, to put in the eddy viscosity in our simulations here. And doing that, we got a reasonably good agreement between the measured, again, this is the power amplification here for this kind of configuration, measurement compared with X simulations, and we got a reasonably good agreement for this relatively tricky case. So, finally, I wanted to talk about this in some more detail. 
So this is a relatively recent European project called Ideal Event. You see the partners here. And it's a bit different because normally when you talk about aircraft noise, it's the exterior noise. But here it was actually the cabin noise created by the climate system. The climate system in airplanes is driven by what you could call an axial fan or perhaps rather an axial compressor because it's spinning with maybe 80,000 RPM. It's a very high speed rotating machine. So in this project, we did a number of uh, things involving multiports. Partly was done with, with uh, Michael Schur and NTS. And I will show you some of these things because they are especially relevant for this issue we started with, the installation effects. The installation effect can be both acoustic, meaning that you have to consider the sort of acoustic response of your system. It's not a free field condition, so you need to know the acoustic response of the system. But also your source strength, of course, of your uh, mechanisms can change because of the inflow conditions. So the problem we decided to study was orifices, either a single orifice or tandem orifice with different separations, 2D or 4D, and finally 9D. The 9D is not shown here. So essentially for the 2D and 4D, you can see there's a strong, this is the mean flow field. There is rather strong interaction, obviously, with the two orifices, but not shown the 9D, more or less, that separation is enough to avoid any flow interaction effects seen from the mean flow field. Okay, so the scheme was like this. We want to study installation effects using orifice plates. We first measure and simulate single orifice to get the multiport. We do the same for the tandem orifice congregation with different distances. Then we use this data and the multiport model, combining them, the matrices, just multi multiplication, to predict the tandem configuration, assuming that the single orifice data is unchanged when you combine them. This is a bit questionable, of course, for the source part. And then we take the computed and measured for the tandem and compare. And the difference is what we call well, related to the acoustic and aerodynamic installation effects. So normally we would expect the sketching matrices. They should handle the acoustic installation effects. Shouldn't be a big problem. But you can be more worried about the source strengths, as we saw in the previous picture, because really the flow is changing a lot when we are closely mounted. So we had the data for the single orifices, and then we just combined them with the known theoretical solution for a straight duct with hard walls. So you could take this measured or calculated, and this one the same, and then combine with the computed straight duct between them to get the tandem. Okay, this is the experiment set up at KTH. This is flow is coming from that direction, goes through the pipe here. This is the uh, test section with the orifices. And as you can see, we really had to, to reduce vibrations here in the walls, having basically a constrained layer damping, rubber and some steel clamping on the outside to really keep the pipes from not vibrating. This is the close-up of the microphones. So it's 12 microphones to do the way the composition, no, sorry, yeah, 12 on each side. 12 on each side to decompose six propagating modes uh, on both sides of the orifices. 16 loudspeakers for the excitation of incident waves and the scattering matrix. And the details of the experiments you can find in this paper. Oops. So this is the uh, numerical work done by NTS and Michael Schur. Basically, it's this uh, IDDS method, which is a hybrid run, CLS method. And the configuration you see down here. And it's important for this discussion here to notice that, I mean, this is prepared to do good uh, fluid dynamic computations for the case. But it's not at all sort of prepared with uh, acoustic reflection-free boundaries. But as I said before, we don't need that using this approach. Then we applied uh, for the um, scattering, we applied linear nervous stokes equations. And here we took, which now is available in Compton Multiphysics, they have a module which is full. I mean, it's not like they used to do before. A simplified energy equation, this is both the mass and momentum plus the full energy equation. And you can also add here the, the uh, effect of, of uh, the viscosity into the modeling. So the procedure was then basically, I mean, you took the data from the uh, IDDS model, 
you time average that to get the mean flow. You put in the mean flow here, and then you solve for the acoustic scattering. And that's how you compute the scattering matrix. And this is some examples showing just the plane wave mode and the first radial mode. All the other modes between were also computed. So essentially you can say that there's a good agreement of the reflection and transmission for the plane wave upstream. There is some discrepancy, for instance, seen here. Oops, this is a bit tricky. Uh, seen here for the plane wave mode uh, downstream. But generally speaking, we were quite happy with this agreement, and we expect that this difference you see here is actually related to this fact. Because when we are doing the mode decomposition, as I said, we assume, oops, we assume that we have uh, rigid walled modes, and of course, they are equal in the plus and minus direction. The real modes in the system are not like that. They are actually different in plus and minus direction up and downstream. And the thing which is happening here is that we get to bias error because if we used exactly the same sampling points in the experiments as in the numerical procedure, that bias error would be the same, but now we are using different sets of sampling points. And that's why we get this small difference here related to the fact that the true mode shapes are actually not even the same in plus and minus direction. And they are a bit different from the ones we are using. That's one of the reasons for the errors. There are some other possibilities too, but. Anyhow, when you combine to predict the tandem scattering, because this is, contains both the reflection and transmission, so it's a mix of all this, you don't really see a big error. This is a predicted scattering for uh, transmission and reflection for the plane wave and the second 2 zero mode at the 2D, the closest distance. This is where you would expect the largest sort of interaction aerodynamically with the meteorophysis, but still it's an excellent agreement for this scattering data. And the other separations have the same very good agreement. Uh, then going to the source strengths, here we applied this procedure as I discussed before to sort of improve this relatively low max data by having a number of sets of independent data, combining them to sort of remove uh, flow noise. So essentially we applied this equation and did it at a number of, in total, four different sets of points with 250 points in each. So each of these zones, rather, one, two, three, four, had 250 points, and each of them were used then to produce an estimate of PS plus, and then that was combined to get sort of a measure which for using correlation techniques with the reduced error relative to the flow noise. And note that here, of course, we had effects of the boundaries. We had reflections here, but since we could get or use the scattering matrix from the first simulation using linear scenario stokes, it could clean that out from the estimate. I use the data here, removing reflections, and get the true reflection-free source data. This was then compared with experiments, and you see the result here. It's pretty good. The plane wave is close to perfect. There are some more deviations for the high order modes. But if you compute the total level, it's surprising. I mean, all the modes were within one to two dB accuracy. So it was really, really very good, I would say, predicting the total level of this sound using this approach. So combining then uh, the source strengths, as expected, it only worked for the longest distance. This is the 9D separation. The 2D, 4D, you get the large deviation when you use the single orifice data to predict the combined dual tandem orifice for shorter distances than 9D because the disturbance of the inflow is too large. It works for the scattering data, but not for the source data. Okay, to summarize. So multi-porch models have traditionally been associated with experiments, but a growing trend the last 10 years is to determine multi-port data by CFD models. The basis for multi-port models is to project the field on acoustic modes, which will reduce hydrodynamic noise, turbulence, and vorticity in the data. The multi-port procedure will create reflection-free data, which makes it ideal, I would say, for comparing numerical and experimental work. And multiport models are also excellent to analyze cases where flow sound interactions like vortex sound are important. Orifice plates, T junctions, etc. And this opens, as I've shown, the possibility to produce, to, to predict the amplification of sound and whistling by finding the unstable eigenfrequencies. So I think this is our experience from the last 10 years using these original experimental methods to various kind of numerical schemes. 
And since we also have the experimental capability since, well, partly developed also the last 10 years for high-order modes, but now we have a nice mix. You can both do nice experiments and combine that with high-fidelity uh, numerical simulations. Thank you.